Night Messengers, Chapter 19 of Shardick by Richard Adams The cage had taken all day to complete, if complete it were. On hearing his orders, Baltus, the master smith, had shrugged his shoulders, making light of Keldrek, whom he had heard of as a simple young fellow with neither family, wealth, nor craft, for in his eyes hunters were not craftsmen. He and his men, being armed with excellent weapons of their own making, had supposed that they were about to play their part in the sack of Bekla, or at any rate, the sack of Gelt, and took it ill to be called out of the march and put back on their accustomed work. Kelderek, having tried in vain to bring home to the great lumbering fellow the vital importance of what he had to do, went back to Tacominion, catching him just as he was about to set out with the advance guard. Tacominion, cursing with impatience, summoned Baltus to him under the tree which bore the body of Fesselhasta, and promised him that if the cage were not complete by nightfall, he should hang like the baron. This was talk that Baltus could understand clearly enough, and he immediately asked for double the number of men he expected to get. Tacominion, being in too much haste to argue, allowed him fifty, including two rope-makers, three wheelwrights, and five carpenters. As the army wound away up the valley in the thickening, sultry morning, Keldrek and Baltus fell to their work. Messengers were sent back to Ortelga, and before midday all the stored fuel on the island, much of its stock of sawn timber, and every piece of forged iron had been carried up to the camp by women and boys. The iron was of different lengths and thicknesses, much of it too short to be of use except as pieces for welding. Baltus set his men to make three axles and as many iron bars as possible, the latter to be of equal length and thickness, pointed and pierced at both ends. Meanwhile, the carpenters and wheelwrights, using seasoned wood, some of which had until that morning formed part of the walls, roofs, and tables of Ortelga, built a heavy platform of strutted planks, which they raised with levers and mounted upon six spokeless wheels, solid wood to the rims. By evening, Baltus's men had forged, welded, or cut sixty bars, disparate, rough-edged things, yet serviceable enough to be driven point-first through the holes drilled round the edges of the platform, and then secured with iron pins. "'The roof will have to be wooden, too,' said Baltus, looking at the poles sticking up out of the planks and pointing this way and that like a bed of reeds. "'There's no more iron, young man, and none to be had, so no use to fret over it.' "'A wooden roof will shake to pieces,' said the master carpenter. "'It'll not hold the bear, not if he goes to break it.' "'It's not work to be done in a day,' growled Baltus. "'No, not in three days. A cage to hold a bear? "'I was the first to see Lord Shardick come ashore yesterday morning, "'barring that poor devil Lucan and his mate.' "'How's the bear to be brought to the cage?' interrupted the carpenter. "'Ah, that's more than we know.' "'You are here to obey Lord Tocominion,' said Keldrick. It is the will of God that Lord Shardick is to conquer Bekla, and that you will see with your own eyes. Make the roof of wood if it must be so, and bind the whole cage round with rope, twisted tight. The work was finished at last by torchlight, and Keldrek, when he had dismissed the man to eat, remained alone with Sheldra and Elith, peering and probing, kicking at the wheels, fingering the axle pins, and finally testing each of the six bars set aside to close the still open end. "'How is he to be released, my lord?' asked Nelith. "'Is there to be no door?' "'The time is too short to make a door,' answered Keldrek. "'When the hour comes to release him, we will be shown the way.' "'He must be kept drugged, my lord, as long as possible,' said Sheldra. "'For neither that nor any other cage will hold Lord Shardick if he is minded otherwise.' "'I know it,' said Keldrek. "'We might as well have made a cart to put him in. "'If only we knew where he is.' He broke off as Zilfi came limping into the torchlight, raised her palm to her forehead, and at once sank to the ground. "'Forgive me, Lord,' she said, drawing her bow from her shoulder and laying it beside her. "'We have been following Lord Shardick all day, and I am exhausted, with fear even more than with fatigue. He went far—' "'Where is he?' interrupted Keldrek. "'My Lord, he is sleeping on the edge of the forest, not an hour from here.' "'God be praised!' cried Keldrek, clapping his hands together. I knew it was his will. It was Rance, my lord, who brought him back, said the girl, staring up at Keldrek as though even now afraid. We came upon him at noon, fishing in a stream. He lay down near the bank, and we dared not approach him. But after a long time, when it seemed that there was nothing to be done, Rance, without telling us what she intended, 
suddenly stood up and went out into the open where Lord Shardick could see her. She called him. My lord, as I live, she called him, and he came to her. We all fled in terror, but she spoke to him in a strange and dreadful voice, rebuking him and telling him to return, for he should never have come so far, she said. And Shardick obeyed her, my lord. He passed by her where she stood. He made his way back at her command. God's will, indeed, said Keldrek with awe. And all that we have done is right. Where is Rancé now? I do not know, my lord, said Zilfi, almost weeping. Nito told us we were to follow Lord Shardick, and that Rancé would overtake us, but she did not, and it is many hours now since we last saw her. Kelderek was about to send Sheldra up the valley, when a challenge and answer sounded from further up along the road. After a pause, they heard footsteps, and Numis appeared. He, too, was exhausted, and did not ask Kelderek for leave to sit before flinging himself to the ground. "'I've come from beyond Gelt, he said. "'We took Gelt easy, set it on fire. "'Not much fighting, but we killed the chief, "'and after that the rest of them were willing enough "'to do what Lord Tuckleminion told him. "'He talked to some of them alone, "'and I dare say he asked them what they knew about Bekla, "'how to get there and all the rest of it. "'Anyway, whatever it was. "'If he gave you a message, tell me that,' said Kelderek sharply. "'Never mind what you heard or suppose. "'This is the message, sir. "'I expect to fight the day after tomorrow. "'The rains can be no later.' and now the hours are more precious than stars. Bring Lord Shardick, no matter what the cost. Kelderek jumped up and began pacing to and fro beside the cage, biting his lip and smiting his clenched fists into his palm. At length, recovering himself, he told Sheldra to go and find Rancé, and if Shardick had been drugged, to bring back word at once. Then, fetching some brands to start a fire, he sat down by the cage, with Numis and the two girls, to wait for news. None spoke, but every now and again Kelderek would look up, frowning, to mark the slow time from the wheeling stars. When at last Zilfi started and laid a hand on his arm, he had heard nothing. He turned to meet her eyes, and she stared back at him, holding her breath, her face half firelit, half in shadow. He too listened, but could hear only the flames, the fitful wind, and a man coughing somewhere in the camp behind them. He shook his head, but she nodded sharply, stood up, and motioned him to follow her along the road. Watched by Nilith and Numis, they set off into the darkness, but had gone only a little way when she stopped, cupped her hands, and called, "'Who's there?' The reply, Nito, was faint but clear enough. A few moments later, Keldrek caught at last the girl's light tread and went forward to meet her. It was plain that in her haste and agitation she had fallen, perhaps more than once. She was begrimed, disheveled, and grazed across the knees in one forearm. Her breath came in sobs, and they could see the tears on her cheeks. He called to Numis, and together they supported her as far as the fire. The camp was astir. Somehow the men had guessed that news was at hand. Several were already waiting beside the cage, and one spread his cloak for the girl across a pile of leftover planks, brought a pitcher, and knelt down to wash her bleeding grazes. At the touch of the cold water she winced, and as though recalled to herself, began speaking to Kelderek. Shardick is lying insensible, my lord, not a bowshot from the road. He has been drugged with Feltokarna, enough to kill a strong man. God knows when he will wake. With Feltokarna? "'asked Nilith incredulously. "'But,' Nito began to weep again. "'And Rancé is dead, dead! "'Have you told Lord Keldrek how she spoke to Shardick beside the stream?' "'Zilthi nodded, staring aghast. "'When Shardick had passed her and gone, "'she stood for a time stricken, it seemed, "'as though, like a tree, she had called lightning down to her. "'Then we were alone, she and I, "'following the others as best we could. "'I could tell... I could tell that she meant to die, that she was determined to die. I tried to make her rest, but she refused. It is not two hours since we returned at last to the edge of the forest. All the girls could see her death upon her. It was drawn about her like a cloak. None could speak to her for pity and fear. After what we had seen by the stream at noon, any one of us would have died in her place, but it was as though she were already drifting away, as though she were on the water and we on the shore." We stood near her, and she spoke to us, yet we were separated from her. She spoke, and we were silent. Then, as she ordered, I gave her the box of Theltokarna, and she walked up to Lord Shardick as though he were a sleeping ox. 
She cut him with a knife and mingled with Otokarna with his blood, and then, as he woke in anger, she stood before him yet again, with no more fear than she had shown at noon, and he clutched her so she died. The girl looked about her. Where is the Tukinda? Get the long ropes on the cage, said Kelderek to Baltus, and set every man to draw it. Yes, and every woman, too, except for those who carry torches. There is no time to be lost. Even now we may be too late to reach Lord Tuckominion. Less than three hours later, the enormous bulk of Shardik, the head protected by a hood made from cloaks roughly stitched together, had been dragged with ropes down the slope and up a hastily piled ramp of earth, stones, and planks into the cage. The last bars had been hammered into place, and the cage, hauled in front and pushed behind, was rocking and jolting slowly up the valley towards Gelt.